All right, good morning, y'all. Thank y'all for having me here. Uh, and happy Mother's Day again. This is, this is actually a really exciting Mother's Day for my family and I. Uh, my wife and I, is our first Mother's Day with our five-month-old daughter, Tobin. I'm not sure if you got to meet her. Um, it's really fun. It's actually, the, I haven't really been around babies that much in my life. We didn't have any babies in my family growing up. And, and so having Marianne's leadership and guidance with this, uh, this, new, this new life in our house has been a huge blessing. I'm incredibly grateful for that. Um, and actually, I think despite all that, I think I'm actually a pretty good dad. And I'm not sure if that's because, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not sure if that's because Marion does all the hard work or because it's only been five months. I mean, it's probably both. All of you, all of y'all like, oh my gosh, she has no idea what's coming. Wait till she's 13. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it's funny. In all seriousness, there's, I try to help out with some of the 3 a.m. feedings and the times when she's crying for whatever it seems like forever. But I don't know, I don't know if you feel this way. But I feel like some of the hard times are really what, uh, what, draw, what draw me closer to Tobin and draw me closer to Marianne. It's like during the fun, happy times when we're all laughing and smiling. It's like they're made all the better because I know what we've gone through just to get there. You know, and you don't even have to be a parent. Like, I mean, just think about your family or your friends. You know, I, I mean, do you ever feel like that? Like, it, like the tough times we go through just draw us closer? And so I think about my relationship with Jesus. And I think about some of the times that we're just the hardest, most difficult, challenging times of my life, I feel like I felt his presence even more. And I'm not saying I enjoy the valleys of life by any means. I'm not sure any of us would necessarily say that. But what I'm saying is I think when we go through some of these challenging times, we see and experience God in ways that I think we normally might miss. And so this morning, we're going to talk about these five women, these five moms who went through some really challenging situations in some circumstances that might even be a little bit uncomfortable for us to talk about, a little disturbing. And we're going to see God demonstrate the power of his grace to work through anyone's life, to work in anyone's situation, no matter what they've, been, no matter what they've done and no matter what's been done to them. So if you like taking notes, um, we're going to have a lot to go through. The title of the sermon is called Indelible Grace, the idea that we can't resist the grace of God. We can't just, we can't just get away from it. It's so powerful. There's nothing that we can do to stop God's might and God's goodness. His grace will accomplish his perfect will in your life. I'm really excited to get into this. We're going to, um, we're going to look at Matthew 1. We're going to skip around a little bit. But if you want to turn to Matthew 1, we're going to, we're going to move a little quick. I want to make sure we can, I don't want to take up all y'all's day. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 3, we're going to be introduced to all these different moms. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, we're going to skip down to five, and Solomon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. We're going to skip down a little bit. And David was the father of, this, of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. That's Bathsheba. We're going to go all the way down to 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. So we're going to look at all these different women. And there's something we need to recognize. There's 42 generations in this whole lineage we see in Matthew. There's 42. And of those 42... Only five women are even mentioned at all. There's something significant about these women. There's something significant about their stories and what God did in their lives that we're going to learn about today. We're going to start with Tamar. So if you want to flip over to Genesis uh, chapter 38, Tamar has a, has a really interesting story. If you're familiar with Tamar, then you know that she was a Canaanite. We'll get into that a little bit more. And that she was married, and her first husband was evil, and so he was killed her second husband was also evil, and so he was, the scripture says God put him to death. And then her father-in-law, who's legally obliged to take care of her, like rejected her and sent her back to her home to be pretty much disgraced and condemned to just die without any children, without any family. And then she kind of comes up with her own little plan to have a kid, and uh, it seems a little questionable, but we're going to look into her really quick. And so what we're going to see, here's this first thing, if you're taking notes, this first thing we want to see about Tamar, is that she was an outsider. And so she didn't quite fit in already. She's, a, she's outside of the people of God. She's what's known as a Canaanite. In the land of Canaan, these people were known for being incredibly violent. Sometimes they practiced, like, child sacrifice. But for the most part, we know the Canaanites as being polytheistic. They worshiped all these false gods and were fornicators and all sorts of just uh, immoral things. And so when the, when the original audience would have heard this about Tamar, they would have just been disgusted 
When the original people that, were, that this story was written to, they'd have been like, oh my gosh, who, how could this woman be part of Jesus' lineage? It's like she's a Raiders fan or something crazy like that. She would, <laughs> she would not be received well. And so the next thing I want us to see is that she was rejected. You know, I, I distinctly remember a time when I was clearly rejected. I was in eighth grade, and I wasn't the stud you see before you today. <laughs> and uh, I walked up to the, the most popular girl in school, her name was Kelly, naturally. And I was like, hey, Kelly, um, you uh, want to be my girlfriend? And it, it was really it was swift. She didn't do that. Well, she was like, uh, no. You know, it was quick. I was clearly rejected. Some of the guys here are like, yeah, I know how that feels, but they're not raising their hand. <laughs> it was painful, but the rejection that Tamar experienced was far greater. Her first husband, I mentioned that to her, mentioned that to y'all, his name was Ur. Now, the Bible doesn't say why he was killed. It just said that he was so wicked that God put him to death. Historians, like outside of the Bible, Jewish, Jewish historians would say that he, was, he thought she was beautiful, that Tamar was, incredibly, was an incredibly beautiful woman, and that he didn't want to ruin her body by getting her pregnant. That's well, kind of shallow. So I'm sure if, if that's the kind of guy he is already, I can't even imagine the other things that he's willing to do or not do. And so God put him to death. So because of the law in Canaan, the next brother, the next younger brother, was supposed to marry her. So that was uh, Onan. Now, Onan was kind of, I mean, I guess they say the apples didn't fall too far from the tree. He pretty much just wanted to sleep with her, but never actually get her pregnant. He just wanted to use her body for his own pleasure, his own enjoyment. And so, I mean, you can begin getting the idea of how Tamar is like, is this all I'm for? Is this all I'm worth? And then God puts Onan to death. So now Judah is thinking, so Judah actually thinks that Tamar is the reason for this. So he's like, well, my, my youngest son is too young for you. Um, go, go away. Go back to your home, and I'll give him to you when he's older. He's not going to get, and she kind of, like, the fact that he was sending her away is already a sign that I'm abdicating my legal responsibility to care for you, though the, though the community would still see her as belonging to him. But he was like, I, I want nothing to do with you. So now she's, been, she's, she's pretty much been um, and, like, married to a really shallow guy, with Ur, married to an even maybe worse objectifying shallow man in Onan, and then rejected by her father-in-law. Now, I pray that no one in here has experienced this type of pain, this type of rejection. But if you have, then you might have a better understanding of why Tamar reacted the way that she did. Why, what happened is she found out that Judah, her father-in-law, was going to this big party. His wife had died, he was mourning, and now he wanted to go party and get drunk, and do a whole bunch of his stupid things. So she decides to kind of take matters into her own hands. She dresses herself as a prostitute and waits on the side of the road. Now the scripture, if you look through the story, you'll see it. She's literally just, she's just standing there, and Judah's like, what's up? And comes up after and like approaches her. She doesn't have to do anything. So now we're seeing more about Judah's character. He, he just finished mourning the, the death of his wife, and now he's trying to get with this prostitute he just met on the side of the road. For payment, she pretty much gets three forms of identification from him, basically, as a collateral. But what I want us to see is later on in the passage, we find out that, or Judah is informed that she's pregnant. And he's like, well, bring her out. She needs to be burned. The adulteress must be burned. He, the reason he found out is because he's still legally responsible for her. And so he's going to execute the, the death of her, but he didn't want to have any responsibilities. That's, again, we're seeing some really messed up things here. And she says, when they brought her out, she says, wait, by the man to whom these belong, she held these three forms that only he would have, a ring, a cord, and a staff. By the man to whom these three, these three things belong, and we'll see it in uh, verse 26, she says, I'm, I'm pregnant. Like, the, this guy right here, whoever owns these, that's the guy who made me pregnant. And they're like, oh man, that's Judah. So you're not an adulteress, that's part of the law. He, he can do that, it's kind of, it seems kind of weird to us, but he can do that, and that's Okay. And then Judah replies in in verse 26. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her my son Shelah. And then then says he did not know her again. He didn't sleep with her again. He took care of her. What's really important here is that her sons, she had twins. One of them was Perez. And that would continue the lineage of Jesus Christ. God could have given her any number of kids, but he gave her a son that that would continue the lineage of Jesus, that would continue down the line. God intentionally put her and her story and her actions into the ancestry of Jesus Christ. 
But why would, we, why, why, why would God want to do that? Why would he want us to encounter a woman who was willing to, what some might even call a, maybe incestuous, but a really questionable decision? A woman who was so afflicted by, these other, by the sin of these other men, why would he want that for us? You see, God's ultimate plan was never derailed. God never stopped loving her. God never abandoned her. God never forgot about her. In the midst of all that horrible thing that was going on, all those horrible sins, and even maybe her questionable decision, that couldn't stop God from accomplishing his will to redeem and bring about the birth of Jesus Christ many, many generations later. So we're going to keep going a little quick. We're going to hop over to um, Rahab. That's going to be in Joshua 2. So Rahab, if you're familiar with her, Throughout Scripture, she's almost exclusively identified as Rahab the harlot. She was a prostitute kind of by choice, possibly. I mean, I, I, Scripture doesn't tell us that she was forced into it, but it said that was her career. And what we see in Rahab is a woman who ultimately turned from her past to a new life in Jesus Christ. It's really exciting here. The first thing I want us to look at, though, is that she has a shameful past. Now, I know several Christians who continue to say things like, oh man, I, just, I, I carry this guilt. Like I've done so many things in my past before I knew Jesus, or I've done things even after I knew Jesus. And they carry this shame, this guilt. They say things like, God could never use me because of what I've done. Or that's great that God forgives me, but I can never forgive myself. Your past does not prohibit God from using you in the present and in the future. And we're going to see that with Rahab. Next thing, this one, is, this one there's a lot of talk about. She lied. People say, well, okay, so Rahab lied because she, she hid the spies in the roof of her house, and she lived in the city of Jericho. And the guards had found out, so they come to Rahab, and they said, Rahab, where are the spies that have come to you? Where have they gone? She says, I don't know. They're in the roof. I don't know. They're, they, they left out the city gate, and if you hurry, surely you will catch them. And so they run off the city gate, and she goes back up there, and she's like, Hey, y'all, I just sent them away. You're going to be fine. So she lies. So people have said, does this mean that God's okay with people lying because Rahab lied and, and she saved the spies? Does that mean that God's okay with us lying in, in times of war or certain circumstances? I, th I, think, I think we're reading too much into it. Here's the reality. When someone doesn't know God, we ought not be surprised that they act like a person that doesn't know God. I mean, if... if if, if, there's a, if there's a sinner who is sinning, it's because they are a sinner. They don't know any alternative. They don't know. They haven't met Jesus. At this point, Rahab had not even yet converted to Christianity, had not even converted, had not even changed to say, your God will be my God, as Ruth is going to say later on. She's still learning. I hope that our churches are willing to welcome uh, people in our community who may still act like sinners, who may not know how to sing, may not know how to worship. It can get a little uncomfortable. And, and I think Rahab is someone who can make us feel a little uncomfortable. You know, if, she, if, she, if that person took your chair or, or, or sat this place, you know, they, they, don't, they don't know any better. They don't know any better. And see, Rahab isn't commended for this lie. She's commended for a lifetime of righteousness after having lived a, a life of previous sin. We see her coming from the old coming in contact with God, and then living, walking in a new life with Jesus Christ kind of thing, right? It's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's a miracle to see this happen. And we look for, we look to the next point. She affirms God. We're not told how she knows this. It's in verse, where is it, 2, 11. She's saying to the spies, and as soon as we heard it, talking about the, uh, the army of Israel, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you, for the Lord your God. He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She's actually quoting like certain scriptures and certain things from Deuteronomy, and we're not really told how she knows this. I've, there's two different theories that I, I really like a lot. I think these are the ones I've seen the most. One is that the Holy Spirit revealed it to her. The, the, power, of the, the power of God's Spirit showed up and, shown her, and showed her these things that she could never know on her own. If that's true, then again, we see God's grace working in this woman's life despite her life of previous sin. Like you, you don't have to think that what you've done in the past is going to hold you back from God loving you and God working in your life today. Or another thing I've heard, which is really creative, is that she may have heard the story from some of her clients 
some of the men who'd been traveling around and heard of this army that had destroyed the Egyptians and you know, crushed them with this Red Sea and destroyed other, vill- other tribes and towns and villages nearby. And that's kind of interesting. Because then if, if she's hearing it from these men who are engaging in, in prostitution or soliciting a prostitute, then again we see that God's word and God's message and God's will isn't hindered by the acts of sinners. Like nothing can stop God from accomplishing his will. Do not think that what you've done in the past is going to stop you. It's going to stop God from working in your life today and tomorrow and every day after. Don't, don't get caught up in that lie. And that's, that's really what I think we can what we can get from Rahab's story is that she has this, this shameful past that, that maybe, maybe she might want to hide a little bit. Maybe she might want to tell people about that because later in the story you'll read that one of the spies ends up marrying her and her son would go on to, um, I, think, I, think her, I think she was the grandfather of Boaz, which we'll, we'll meet in a second or two. And uh, so she gets to be part of the lineage of Jesus as well. But we, th- we think about stories like the prodigal son. If you're familiar with that story, Jesus told this parable of a, a, a young man who pretty much said, you know, forget you, dad. Give me all, of, give me all the money that you're going to give me when you die. And he goes out, parties, and does all these crazy things, spends it all, and says, I need to go back to my dad. Even his slaves have a better life than me. He goes back to his dad. His dad pretty much just loves him. It's a, it's a, it's a symbol of how God loves us in spite of what we've done. Right there, we see God's grace loving us in spite of our sin. If you look at Saul, who, who, uh, who was at first this guy who was persecuting Christians. He was killing other Christians. I mean, I, I don't know if I would call it murder, but it definitely wasn't a good thing that he was doing. And then Jesus shows up, and he's converted. He goes from Saul to Paul. And what we see there is we see God's grace working uh, to still use you in spite of your sin. God can still love you in spite of your sin, and God can still use you in spite of your sin, in spite of your past. What a great encouragement, moms. What a great encouragement, church that we see this story of Rahab. I'm so happy that she's part of Jesus' lineage. We're going to flip over to the book of Ruth, and we're going to catch up with Ruth. And I think I can even slow down a little bit. I just, I know, you know, we got got to have lunch, we got Mother's Day picnics and barbecue. I want to get you all out. Um, All right, so Ruth. Ruth is, is, uh, is often seen as a love story. We have uh, Ruth who, who will meet Boaz, and it's this beautiful thing. But today, I want us to focus on a different type of beauty. We're going to focus on the beauty of adversity. So here's kind of a, a quick overview, a little paraphrase of what was going on with, uh, with Ruth. She had just married, uh, and her, she was, I think she's traveling back to Judah, the land of Judah, and her husband dies. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, her husband dies. So now, her, her, now, her, now Ruth's husband's dead, her father-in-law's husband's dead, and then another woman traveling with her named Orpah, who was the brother of Naomi, of Ruth's husband, son of Naomi's. <laughs> he dies. So now there's these three women. One of them is way beyond childbearing age, and two of them have been married and are, no longer, are probably no longer virgins, which is a big deal in this time period. And they're just kind of off on their own. All their husbands are dead. There's no more men. And the way society was set up back then is without a man or without a, without a son, as a woman, you're, you're, I mean, that's, that spells disaster. And so we see Naomi just completely just freaking out, understandably. I mean, if, we've, if you've ever been through some of these hard circumstances, you can understand why it's just hard to be like, God, you probably still love me right now. That's why you're doing this. You've taken all these things away because you love me. We'll see later on that she changes her name from Naomi to Mara or Mara, which means bitter. The first thing I want us to notice about Ruth, though, is that she was a Moabite, similar to Tamar, who was a Canaanite. She's still another outsider, and even more so because she was leaving Moab and going to the land of Judah, where the people who would probably look down on her and say, you're from a condemned land of people who worship false gods and just do crazy things and just going to look down on her again. I, I wonder if some of us have ever experienced something like that. Maybe people, someone treated you different because of the family you grew up with or where you were from or how you were raised. I think we can kind of relate to Ruth a little bit, just in that area already. We don't even have to have gone through some of these hard things. Sometimes just people judge you based on your background or judge us because of, who, because of uh, where we've come from. But this part about her facing extreme adversity, Ruth faced extreme adversity. 
I, I can't even imagine. The closest thing I could get to that it would be uh, if my wife, Marianne, were to die. That would be really traumatic for me. I can definitely, like, I, I think about them, like, oh, maybe I'd go home to my family and hope that they can do something for me. And that's pretty much what Naomi said to Ruth and Orpah. Go back home. Leave. Go back to your family. Maybe something will work out for you. Don't come with me. My, like, the God has sent his hand upon me. He set his hand against me, and it, it, it'd be bad. Just, just go back home. And Orpah's like, no, I don't want to. And she's like, go. And she's like, okay, I'm going to go. But Ruth, and here's this amazing thing. It's amazing uh, scripture we've all, I don't know if you've heard it. If you haven't, you're in for a treat. It's, I, I love it. It's in Ruth chapter 1, and it's verse 11, or 16. But Ruth said, she's talking to Naomi, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. I, I think about that. The first thing I think of is like, man, I remember when I was standing on the stage saying, making these vows to my wife. You know, she's, that last part is an oath that Ruth's making, but she's pretty much given up her people. She's given up her God. She's given up her, where she's going to sleep and live. And she's given up everything to say, I want none of that, and I want all of this. It's like when a sinner turns, it's like when one of us turns to Jesus. We say, I want none of my old life. I want none of that sin. I want all of Jesus. That's really cool to see Ruth turning that way. And she's doing that after all these horrible things have happened. She's facing certain death pretty much. She's, as a woman at this time, she was probably thinking, if I stay with Naomi, um, we're probably going to die from starvation. Or some man will attack us on the side of the road, and that'll be it. But she's willing to say, well, you know what? If that's it, I want to at least be with you and with God. That's, that's encouraging, because I don't know... I, I'm only 26 years old, and it would be, I think it would be insulting for me to say that I've been through some of the hard things that many of you have probably had to endure. I have yet to know what, what, the real, what, really, what really, really hard things can be like, what true adversity can be. I haven't lived very long. But some of you, maybe you're thinking in your mind, you can, you can go back to these times where stuff happened with friends, or, or maybe you even served in the military, and you can think about times where you're just like, I know, God, that you say you're everywhere, but there's, I don't know how you're in this moment right now, God, because it is so hard. I've heard stories from even um, uh, veterans who served in Vietnam who would say there was no way God was in those jungles. There's no way. The things that went on there were just horrible. And Ruth is experiencing something so close to that, and she can still say, God, be my God. I'll, I'll go into certain death, but as long as you're my God. What an encouragement, y'all. If you feel like you're up against something crazy, think about Ruth. And the next thing we see is that she was humble and lifted up. They finally reached Bethlehem. I believe it was the city of Bethlehem. And it says, and the scripture will say that Ruth gleaned in the fields. Now, <laughs> I'm not much of a farmer, so I had to go on Google and find out what it means to glean. <laughs> and I was like, does that mean she was like, like shiny, like something gleans? Um, I was really surprised to find out that it meant that she was pretty much just going through and just picking up whatever she could find that was left over from all the harvesters. It was equivalent to almost a social welfare type thing because there was an actual law in place that said, hey, if anything drops to the ground, leave it. And, you know, women, people would come by and just pick up whatever food they could find, hoping they'll find something, just picking scraps off the ground. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Ruth was right there picking up some of the, the barley and there were birds and coyotes next to her doing the same thing. I mean, that's kind of depressing too. So it's like, great, all these men have died in my life. I, now I'm eating scraps with the dogs. But she still holds on. Naomi's pretty much given. She's like, I'm bitter. That's where everyone needs to call me. My life is horrible. I, I can relate to that. I can definitely understand that. I think that's where most of us want to go. But what's surprising is those same fields that Ruth was gleaning in, she would later marry the man who owned those fields. I mean, I feel like that's... I feel like we have so many movies like that, from the rags to riches thing. Like, how beautiful is that? But even before that, even before all of the, the happy ending, I am just in awe of what Ruth did before all of that, to hold on to God in spite of all that. And it's not because Ruth was special. We can see that. She wasn't even part of the tribe of, Ju of Judah. She was a Moabite because of God's grace again, all right? See, when we find ourselves in the middle of great adversity, we need to remember that God is still at work. God's still working in that situation, whether you can see it or not. 
I think we need to be willing to seek the kind of humility that Ruth demonstrated. I don't think we're able to do that apart from the grace of God in our life. I, I, I don't think I could ever respond the way Ruth did. It's, it's, an, it's incredible. It's, it's a testimony to how God works. It's a testimony that God is going to work in your situation. I, can't, I cannot stand up here and guarantee that every single time you're going to end up marrying the owner of the fields. But I don't think that's even the best part. I think the best part is that a perfect, holy God was willing to love and pour out his grace and use a woman who wasn't even part of the original chosen group of people. I mean, that's us. Unless you're Jewish, I mean, that's us. We're very much so like Ruth. And yet God has opened up the gates of heaven through Jesus Christ that we may all know him. And we have done nothing. We're, we're, we're outsiders. And he's brought us in. That's, that's the beautiful part. So now we're going to go look at uh, Bathsheba. This is 2 Samuel chapter 11. So again, we, I wish I could cover all of these comprehensively, but this is probably better like a five-month uh, or five-week series than uh, reading all of these. So definitely go back, read through some of these women's stories. It's, it's remarkable how God used these women. A lot of people look at Bathsheba, and her story is a little bit more complicated. One of the reasons for that is because the story in 2 Samuel really isn't even about her. She's a part of it, but the story is meant, the author, is meant, the author was intending to focus on David. So some of the details are left out. And from that, we've had people say, well, Bathsheba was bathing on this roof because she was trying to seduce the king who was on his rooftop, and she was trying to get him because we know Bathsheba is having an affair with the king. That's typically what we think of when we hear Bathsheba. I know there's like a, a movie with him, and I think Bathsheba was David's true love or something crazy. But we'll either say that, we'll, we will either say that Bathsheba seduced David, or we'll say things like Bathsheba was a victim of King David and he was this aggressor and took advantage of her. He was the king. He saw her. She didn't know about it. He lusted after her, brought her in, and slept with her. But again, I want to focus on what God does here. I want to focus on God as the main character and how God's working through all of these circumstances. So the first thing I want us to see here is that she was tragically affected by sin. In James 1.15, he's, James is writing about sin. It says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when full grown, gives birth to death. See, their sin that they engaged in this, this affair, regardless of who started it, sin wants to destroy you. You, don't, you, don't, you can't just mess around with sin. You can't just, you know, it's not, you can't just like play with like a, a matchstick or, or, or like fire. You can't play around with sin. Sin is not like mercury in the 1960s. Sin is like mercury in the 1990s. We know it's poisonous and it'll hurt you. Sin is dangerous. And what we see with her is that she would get pregnant. And in David's effort to try and hide the pregnancy, hide the adultery he just committed, he tried to get Uriah, her husband, to sleep with her, and it wasn't working out. He ends up having Uriah killed in war, kind of secretly. And then he marries uh, his wife to kind of cover it up a little bit. So now we see her husband has died as a result of their actions. Their first child, the one that she got pregnant with, excuse me, that child would also die. I, I can't imagine the pain of that. Her spouse just died, and her first child just died. I mean, I remember when Marion was pregnant, and we were going to the ultrasounds and everything, and um, it was so exciting. And like, here's a baby. Here's our first child. I can't believe where you can even make a baby. That's crazy. And it was such an exciting time. And I imagine as a woman back then, it was even more beautiful. Like, there's life in me. And that was gone from her. It was taken. If you read more into it, you'll see that that was part of a punishment for David's sin. But yet God still loved her, and still worked through her. We'll see that in the next part, is that she became the mother of Solomon. The next son that she would have would become the future king of Israel. And this is really important to recognize because Bathsheba can be really controversial. And again, we see God saying, I'm going to give her a son that's going to continue to be in the lineage of Jesus Christ, thereby bringing her into the storyline. We're talking about her today, and we're talking about all these women today because God desired for them to be a part of Jesus' family tree. 
And some people would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would God want all these, these like shameful stories and, and kind of despicable things and painful um, situations to be a part of the perfect, holy, sinless Jesus? I think, it's, I think it's a big contrast. It shows us that here's the grace of Jesus. Here's how perfect he is and that he is willing, he's, he's going to come and redeem all of this. I think it's an encouragement to us that no matter what we've gone through, that he can redeem all of that, that he loves us, that God isn't saying, I don't want anything to do with those kinds of people. I don't want anything to do with those people who aren't perfect or those people who can't get it right or those people who don't know what they're doing in their life or they're confused about their future or the people who've been made victims of sin. I think God's saying, I love those people, I want those people, and I'm going to prove it by putting them in the storyline, in the family tree of my one and begotten son, Jesus Christ. So our last person we're going to look at is Mary. And so we're going to look at Luke chapter 1 to see her. I think Mary is a little bit misunderstood as well. I've, I've, I've read that people would say that Mary was sinless, she was perfect, that she was uh, more holy than all the other girls around her and the people of her time, and that's why God chose her. The angel who, uh, who spoke with her, so here's the first point, she encountered God's grace. But the angel who spoke with her said, Mary, you have found favor with God. So people have taken that to say, Mary, you found favor because... You were holy because you were sinless, because all the other women around were bad. So God had to choose uh, the good one. You know, the, the girl with the 4.0. That kind of thing, right? And, um, but that, I, I don't quite believe that because I think God didn't choose Mary because of how good she was. I think God chose Mary because of how good he is. And everything that she was able to do because she was, I mean, historically, we're going we're gonna to say that she was probably about 15 years old or so. She was, she was young. She would carry Jesus, nine months probably, and then raise him through his childhood. I mean, that's a pretty big responsibility. That's crazy. There's times in my life, with, and I, I, I hate to admit this, where Tobin's crying. I'm just like, I got to walk away. <laughs> you know, I, I, always, I always thought, like, I'd tell my parents, Man, I can't believe I, I made it past my childhood. I did so many crazy things. I can't believe I didn't, you know, die or get killed or something crazy. And now, looking as a parent, I'm thinking, I can't believe my mom didn't kill me first. You know, like, it's crazy the amount of times that, like, I mean, that's, that's another testimony to God's grace right there. And so we see Mary with this, this incredible calling to kind of raise the, the, the Savior of the world. And I don't know if, if you've ever looked at God and seen all these people or, uh, these, these great heroes of the faith and said, I could never do something like that. That calling is way too much. Well, take a look at Jonah. He was like, I, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I'm going over here. And yet he's still, with speaking maybe, I think eight to 10 words, the entire city repented. Or we look at Moses, who had, I mean, he had killed someone. And God's like, I'm still going to use you. It's, it's crazy. We begin to see this pattern that God isn't necessarily using perfect people. He's using these broken, regular people to show how perfect and mighty and powerful he is. This is about God's glory. And so again, like I said, Mary, she was misunderstood. And here's something I I want to remind you about if you haven't already encountered this. People may not understand what God has called you to do. Mary traveled about 90 miles from the city she lived in to the, the village or the city where her cousin Elizabeth was at. She traveled about 90 miles. Now, I'm, I'm trying to imagine myself as Mary, which is kind of awkward because I'm a boy. But I'm trying to imagine she's there. It says that she was with her cousin for about three months. So she left the, uh, uh, Nazareth, not pregnant. She's already engaged. And she's spent three months in this other town. She's probably going to start showing a little bit. And so she has to tra- take 90 miles back to town. Can you imagine what she was probably thinking over the course of 90 miles? If she had to walk, and she's three months pregnant, I mean, maybe 10 miles a day, the most she could do, maybe. I mean, she probably didn't have, you know, the best hiking shoes or anything. It's probably really painful. If it, if, it, if it was even 10 miles a day, she had at least a week and a half to think in her mind, what are people going to say? I know the law. They're going to probably want to kill me if they find out that I've, if they think that I've committed adultery. 
What's Joseph going to say? I mean, think about it. If you had a, a, a daughter who was, 15, was maybe 15 years old, she went away to summer camp for three months, came back, and she's like, what's up? <laughs> I highly doubt the first thing you're going to say is, oh my goodness, the Holy Spirit has conceived a child in you. You must have found favor. That's not going to be our first response, and that wasn't Joseph's first response either. He, was, he decided that he was going to quietly divorce her so that maybe she could be spared some of the punishment or at least the, the disgrace. But he was like, no, I know what happened here. I haven't seen this movie, but it's called Chariots of Fire with uh, Eric Liddell. And in the movie, because uh, I, researched, I researched this a little bit, in the movie, he finds out like a few weeks before the race, he's about to do, he's going to do this 100-meter sprint in the Olympics, which is his best event. He's super fast. And he finds out that they scheduled the race on a Sunday. And, and with his beliefs, he said that Sunday is, is the Sabbath. That's a holy day. That's not for, for running races. So he withdrew. So in the movie, it's kind of this big tension-filled, oh my gosh, surprise moment. In reality, I think it was... I think it was worse. In reality, what happened was he knew several months in advance. I think that's, that's more challenging because that means he had several months for his country to be like, dude, you could win us a gold medal. For his friends to be like, dude, you could win a gold medal. For everyone around him, even his own conscience to think, is it really that big a deal? I mean, he had months, he had days and days and days of temptation to think, maybe, I, maybe it isn't that big a deal. Maybe I could compromise a little bit. You know, that's kind of, I mean, if, if you ever heard those words in your head, Put a, put, put a little, like, check mark. Those are the same words that Satan pretty much said to Eve. It's not that big a deal. Surely it won't kill you. A little tricky there. And he didn't run in the race. He ended up gold medaling in, I think, the 400 meter and bronze in the 200. People may not understand what God's called you to do. As a Christian, people may not understand why you've forgiven someone. They may not understand why you carry around a 2,000-year-old book. And they'll probably think you're crazy if they find out that you give 10% of your income to a church. Oh, well, that's crazy. That's a waste of money. You could be investing that. It's like, I am. <laughs> and the last thing I want us to see is that she had a God-centered love. It's true. Mary, her, I think her life was filled with pain. It, was, it began with Jesus and, and her condemnation, pretty much. I mean, she knew that she could possibly be killed. And, a lot, and in some degree, kind of ended with seeing her own son tortured and killed on a cross. I mean, that's got to be really painful, at least the three days before. I mean, that's got to be so painful. And had she, I wonder if she had known if that was going to be the future of her son, if she would have walked those 90 miles back to town, or if she would have been like, no, no, we're, we're getting out of here. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of you. I've, uh, I've, heard, I've heard at least two pastors who've lost their sons. Their sons have died, and they said, you know what? I, I would never give up my son for any of you in here. No matter. Yet God was so willing to do that for, for not even a perfect person, but, but broken, sinful people like us. I think Mary would probably do the same. I think she'd be like, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could give up my son to die for all of you, to die for me. Maybe she would. I think Mary loved God's glory more than a pain-free life. I wish I could tell you how to do that, I wish I could say that I had like a, a few more points or another page to turn to say how to, how to want to love God's glory more than your own, your own livelihood, your own welfare. I think about if, if, if you have a, a grandson or a son who, who felt called to missions, let's say Afghanistan, and we know that if, if, they get, if, they're, if they're found out for, caring, for preaching the gospel, they could likely be killed, and they most certainly will be. This book is banned there. I wonder if a human-centered love that focuses on the welfare of, of ourself, our flesh, would say, don't go. No, it's not safe. I'm going to stop you because I love you and I don't want you to get hurt. Now, I don't think that's wrong to feel that way. We are human. But I wonder if a God-centered love would say, I trust that this is what God's called you to do. His glory is what matters most. Again, I say these words quivering a little bit as I think about my own daughter and what God may have in mind for her. Can I say these things to you and then follow that up in my own life? Maybe not. But with God's grace, I believe I can. All these things that these women went through, no, they can't do it on their own. But God still worked in them in spite of their flawed characters, in spite of the sin that happened to them. If you felt like Tamar, if you ever felt like Rahab or Ruth, if you feel connected to any of these stories, like, man, I, I've been there. I have that shameful past. 
I have that person who's done something so hurtful to me. Know that God can still use you. He's still at work right now. Your past doesn't prohibit your present and your future. God's still at work in y'all. And I, I mean, this is, this is Mother's Day, and I think it's so cool that God used moms to tell us this story. Because I, I'm not a mom, but I, I think it's such a hard job. I think if you, if you want a pain-free life, you know, don't, definitely don't be a mom. <laughs> or really, don't even try to love someone. Because the love that a mom has, if you, if you want to get to that point, it's probably one of the most painful things I think you can experience. You, you, you let your kid fall to learn a lesson. You, you, um, you punish them because you love them. You want to keep them protected and safe. And then trying to find the balance of it all. No, we're not always perfect. There's things that we wish maybe we did a little different. And the reality is maybe we all don't have the perfect relationship with our moms or our grandmothers, our grandchildren, our sons. But think back to these women. Take heart. Be encouraged that God wants to use you. Don't be stuck in the past. God loves you, and he has great, great plans for his glory through every single one of us. And I'm so happy to get to preach here on Mother's Day. Let me pray for y'all. God, we thank you so much for your word. Jesus, it's through the word that you've given us in this, this book that we can know the stories of, uh, of your great work that testifies to your glory. God, I pray for all the moms, not just here in Salida Temple Baptist Church, but all around this country, especially this country, God, that we need, we need to return back to you. We're, we're supposed to be a country under God, but Lord, we've become a country away from God. Bring us back, Father, that we can just glorify your name. Lord, we are not perfect. We are not flawless, but your love and your grace is, and you love us so much that you're willing to use these broken vessels like us and make us beautiful for your name's sake. God, may our pursuit and our passion, our uh, obedience to you, draw more people to your son, Jesus Christ, that they may know salvation and the beauty of joy in your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.